Heavenly Father, as we come before you this morning, we ask you to grant us the Holy Spirit uh, that we might understand uh, the message that you have for us. We ask a blessing upon the work that we're doing here and sending this out through the internet. We have been instructed by you to pray for the latter rain in the time of the latter rain, so we ask you to do that at this time. Pour the latter rain out upon us. Let the words uh, that we use to teach this message be clear and concise and that glorify and honor you, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to try taking up now the papacy, the kingdom of the beast in Daniel's last vision. Um, I'm actually winding down, uh, but it's going to take quite a while to do that. But you'll notice on the top of your notes, if you have notes, um, it says Articles of Impeachment, December 10th. 2019, acquittal February 5th, 2020. Um, I want to remind us of something here. The notes that start with another. It's, there, there are new notes today. They're over there. Um, I'm going to put four lines up here. This is the line of the dragon, which would be the king of the south. This is the line of the beast, which is the papacy, the false prophet, the United States, and the 144,000. These are the four kingdoms that are dealt with in Daniel's last vision. <clears throat> and what, what I'm arguing, this is, this is verse 40, um, is that the dragon, the story of the dragon in terms of Raphia and Paneum, that's what I'm speaking about now. Um, that Raphia for the dragon, that's the king of the south, is the midnight cry. And Paneum for the king of the south is the Sunday law. The beast, the papacy, their Raphia, so to speak, is the Sunday law when they prevail at the threefold union and they're defeated at the close of probation um, when Michael stands up when the ten kings burn her with fire the false prophet this is this is uh, the top of your notes articles of impeachment over here for Trump in the illustration of the Republicans and the Democrats and the Constitution. The articles of impeachment were on December 10th and then his exoneration, exoneration if you want to call it that, was on 2520. What do they call it? The 5th of February 2020. Acquittal. Acquittal. Um, and for us, particularly in the story of Elijah and Mark, this is Raphia and Paneum for the f false prophet. For us, the, the offering of P&T um, was 11-9-2019. Since that time, they've been cutting themselves. But our prediction, Elijah's prediction, is July 18th, 2020. This is Paneum for us. Now, the thing that I want to point out here is that all, uh, this to me, this here is the actual application of Daniel 11 verse 40. It's, it's the story of the dragon, the king of the south, that war. The, if these here are harbingers or echoes or inferences. They, they, they're going to have the same type of characteristics. But if you want to argue, okay, where is the verses that are describing Raphael and Paneum in Daniel 11? Where are they applied and who are they applied to? It's the dragon. It's the, it's the struggle of the king of the south. So, Rafi here at the midnight cry is Paneum for us. That's our, our 
um, victory when the prediction of July 18th comes to pass. But the reason I'm starting here is just to, to make an argument, and it's nothing to do with, with lifting myself up or lifting this ministry up. It's part of the argument. Um, the prophetic message that we're understanding is producing light. And that light is designed, among other things, to speak to the Levites and thereafter the Nethanims. So it needs to be part of the public record that um, there was a group of people that were out in front of these um, prophetic issues and could see it in advance. That becomes part of the issue, especially at July 18th. So <clears throat> we, we began to see our history, but when we recognize that the four kingdoms and that the false prophet Trump and the Democrats uh, have their own Rafi and Paneum, then we could go back in and realize that with Paneum, whether it's here or here or here or here, that it's going to have similar characteristics in each case. And, and I can go through and show you some of these similar characteristics that we should expect to see in all these lines. And, and you'll see the logic of them based upon what we understand prophetically takes place at these waymarks. To give you one example of what I mean by that, f forget about Rafi and Paneum right now. At the Sunday Law, based upon Revelation 13 and the spirit of prophecy, Satan appears to personate Christ. Okay, so, so this manifestation of Satan is, the, is what Sister White calls his crowning act. It's the miraculous working of Satan. Okay, that speaks to everything that we've taught about Paneum. Okay, at Paneum you're going to have these, these, mir these false miracles, so on and so forth. So what I'm saying is prophetically, at these waymarks, um, we can take the characteristics that we've recognized from Paneum and Raphia and show them. So what I want to remind us of, okay, is that here we have identified on th at least three witnesses. I can give you the three witnesses, but it's a matter of public record. In the story of the King of the South with Russia, that the midnight cry here, when the United States gets struck by Islam, that it's not just Islam, it's Islam and Russia. There's somehow a relationship here, whether it's uh, illustrated by Attila the Hun or by uh, uh, Muhammad and Urban, the, the cannon maker. And so here we see this relationship of Islam and Russia. And so what I'm saying here, I want to remind us that this, this being Rafia for the King of the South, it's Paneum for us. So because it's Paneum for us, and because at this waymark we're going to see this relationship between Russia and Islam, I want to point out that after we seen Paneum on February 5th, 2020, some of the characteristics that we saw was panic. Okay, we've seen the panic in the stock market. Uh, we've seen the panic in the nations of the world as they shut down the lanes of transportation. We've seen the pandemic. Uh, but yesterday we seen, the last I heard, we seen a barrel of oil go to minus $41 a barrel. Okay, and simple economics tells you that if you're an oil company and you can't give your oil away, because you can't, because right now there's something more precious than oil in that industry, and it's the, the, the ability to store the oil. All the, all the storage tanks are full, and the ones that aren't full, they're, they're at a premium. So you can't give your oil away. If you can't give it away, then simple economics tells you you don't have the money to pay for your refinery to run to make gasoline and you don't have your money to pay for your truck drivers to haul it hither and yon. Um, now it may come, I'm not saying it might not come back right away, but what I want to point out here on that is beyond the pandemic, and I've been mentioning this for a couple of weeks, who started this crash in oil? 
Russia. Islam and Russia. Saudi and Russia. Okay, so immediately after here, we're seeing this as being a Paneum moment that there is a, a, a work uh, where it's Islam and Russia accomplishing something negative. That's all, that's all I'm saying. We've already identified that in, in this history, here at this Paneum, that the strike on Nashville, the logic of it, some of the logic of it is, is Nashville becomes a symbol for Greek education and for Greek competition, the sports of the world. And you've seen since this Paneum comes in that all the sports, not all, but almost all the sports events in the world have been shut down and all the schools have been shut down. Education, so the, the elements that the Parthenon Temple in Nashville symbolize, um, education, competition, those have been dealt with in this first little revelation of Paneum 2, um, along with the economics that we know will lead to a Sunday law. So I just want to, that's not really speaking to the, the message that I want to cover this morning, but I wanted to point out that it was Russia and Saudi Arabia that have added this new element to the mix in this oil crisis. And, and, it's, and I'm saying it's like Pandora's box now. From what they said is Russia and Saudi Arabia were flooding the market to try to drive the, um, the, the frackers in the United States. The, the part of the oil industry that gets oil from the fracking industry. They were trying to put them out of business because at, at, to, do, to make money off the fracking oil you have to have $42 a barrel. They wanted to get it down below $42 to put them out of business. But this is speaking to Pandora's box. <laughs> you, you open the box and it's suddenly out of your control. Uh, I'm sure they didn't want it to get to minus $41 a barrel. And if you've seen any of the pictures in some of the dairy um, industries in the United States, I've seen one somewhere. They just dump it and they're, they're, they're milk out of their, they're just dumping it into the, the gutters because they can't store it and no, there's no demand for the milk. They're all, so it, I'm just using that to say that's kind of, they're not going to do that with the oil, no doubt, but that's kind of where the oil's at now. It's, anyway, okay. And Trump did what yesterday with an executive order? He shut down immigration. Okay, he, he, he's, so in, in the other countries are doing it. Who's going who's gonna to complain about that? And, and who's, who's celebrating the collapse more than... Who's the one public figure that is celebrating the collapse of the oil industry more than any other? The Democratic AOC. Socialist. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Uh, the, the hero of Tess and Parminder. Is celebrating that the oil industry has collapsed, and she put it out on a, on a Twitter feed, and then she immediately thereafter pulled it off, but it was already recorded. Okay, so that that's a kind of mentality yeah. of, of Jesuitism. Yeah. <laughs> it, it don't matter what she's using because she's of the elite. Uh, yes. The, the thing about her that ties back into what you've been teaching is what she's saying is the collapse of that industry allows for the rise of Mother Earth. Now she doesn't say oh, Mother yeah. Earth, but she says a Green New Deal. Yeah. Or this Green Deal, and this that is, our, is Mother Earth. This is our opportunity to invest in the yeah. Green New Deal. Which is the beast definition of Mother and that's the Democrats' definition of mother. It's, wow. And that's the Catholics' definition. That's okay, so, so now I want to begin on the beast. And uh, this is a familiar quote from time past. And it, it's going to take me a while to, to wade through this. I'm sorry, but... Yeah, would you? Yes. So sorry to cut you off there. Um, just looking at your language in connection with the oil, I'm wondering if there's any correlation... Even the language that you said, they can't get rid of the oil, they can't sell their oil. And now we have the wise version repeating to the very letter, and we have oil crisis too, and Adventism with the oil oh, and the virgins. Yeah, I, I've, I've, been, I've brought that up too, that 
this particular industry, it's not an accident that it's the oil industry. It's speaking to the parable of the ten virgins. I agree. In these times of special interest, the guardians of the flock of God should teach that the, the people that the spiritual powers are in controversy. And that's what we've been saying, is that in each of these kingdoms, there's a struggle within their own kingdom between conservatives and liberals at some level. The spiritual powers are in controversy among themselves and with each other. It is not human beings that are creating such, in, such intensity of feeling as now exists in the religious world. A power from Satan's spiritual synagogue is infusing the religious elements of the world, arousing men to decided action to press the advantages Satan has gained by leading the religious world in determined warfare against those who make the Word of God their guide and the sole foundation of doctrine. Satan's masterly efforts are now put forth together in every principle and every power that he can employ to con controvert the binding claims of the Law of Jehovah, especially the fourth commandment that defines who the creator of the heavens, who is the creator of the heavens and of the earth. I, I just want to emphasize that we are we're commanded here to be teaching just what we've been teaching, that the spiritual powers are in controversy. Okay? In the United States, it's the Democrats versus the Republicans. But the United States, as the false prophet, is in controversy with the United Nations, okay? with the World Health Organization and, and, and the globalists. And uh, they're all at odds with one another. Even Trump with the Pope. Um, okay, revealed from Chittim, or Kittim, however we pronounce that. Um, go, well, it's in your notes. Isaiah 23, verse 1. We're going to start with dealing with the beast. And in this history, Isaiah 23 tells us that the papacy is hidden during the history of the United States from 1798 to the Sunday Law. She's hidden. So I want to go through Isaiah 23 and, and make sure that we have that in our minds. Um, if the papacy is hidden, as Isaiah 23 says, for 70 years, then how else, in what other way would the papacy be hidden? What's another numerical value? Seven. 1260. The Sister White lines up the 1260 of papal uh, supremacy with the 70 years of Babylon. In this 70 years, the days of one king, the point of reference is the 70 years of Babylon. So the history of the United States is 70 years, but it's also 1260 years prophetically. And if it's 1260 years prophetically, then what is it also? 25. A 2520. So the history of the United States is the history of a 2520, a seven times, as, as Brahman jumped right to. And we've done that, we've shown that in the beginning of the United States and in the end of the United States. How have we shown that it's, it's governed by 1260s and 2520s in the past? Repeatedly. The president? No. We yeah, Prophets and Kings gives us this prophetic authority to, to line up the 1260 with the 70, but that's not what I'm speaking of, and I'm probably not being very clear, so I'll take credit for that. But I want to remind us what we've done through the years, what we've established concerning the United States. This being the history of the United States, this being the end at the Sunday Law, this being 1798, and in Isaiah 23, it's going to be this days of one king. It's going to be identified as 70 years, but we know that Prophets and Kings 714 tells us it can be 1260 years, but 1260 is a type of a 2520. But we have shown that from here to here, October 22nd, 1844, is how many kings? Seven kings from Manasseh oh, yeah. Yeah. to Zedekiah. 
Okay, but we've also shown over here from this time of the end, this is Manasseh to Zedekiah. So in this history, we have a, a, a chiasm. There you go. Do we have a chiasm in this history? Yeah, this the same as that. There has to be some kind of chiasm. Okay, so this here is a 1260. It's a 70. But you have a, a, chia, a chiasm here. There's all kinds of things you have here. But I'm, I'm going to make one point and then move away from this because if we get, get through these notes, we're going to get back to the four generations. Where does the first generation of Millerite Adventism begin? Begins here in 1798. Why do you know that? Because of the birth of Christ. It says, when Christ was born, the leadership of the Jewish church was passed by. That's the expression Sister White uses in Desire of Ages. They were passed by. So at the time of the end, the previous covenant people are passed by right then and there, even though it's progressive passing by. So right here, this is the birth of Millerite Adventism as Protestantism is being passed by. Right? So, Millerite Adventism continues on. Where does Millerite Adventism go into darkness? 1863. There's always a period of darkness that precedes a reform movement. This is the dark ages. This is the darkness up here of 1957 to 1989. And it brings you to this time of the end. So who's passed by, right? This, oh, yes. Who's passed by here? The Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this is the, the first generation of this movement. But what, what is it also? Is it the first generation? It's the last generation. Yeah. This here... You're not going to have four generations in this history. This is the final generation. Okay, so um, you know that based upon Luke 21, right? Yes. The generation that sees what shall not pass? Budding, Budding trees of spring. And when do the trees begin to bud? 9-11. So by the time you get to 9-11, you know that this is the last generation. Okay. But Jesus, go ahead. I'm just curious if, if during 1989 to the Sunday Law, if it would be similar to where the three angels' messages, messages are all blended. So possibly the four generations are all blended there in this time period also. You're going to get tested here. On all You're going to get tested, but there is no four generations no, in this the, final the, generation. The, the, the four generations had specific way marks to them. And yeah. I'm wondering if that would be part Those of... Those are right over here. Yes. That this, this movement gets tested by these four generations, but this movement is only one generation. It's the yes. final generation. It's it tested in all those, you know, weeping for Tammuz. Yes. Um, all those. That's those ones. four. Yes. So, what I, what I want to show you, if I can, is Jesus illustrates the end from the beginning. So, what happened here? And there's lots of things. Church. Oh, a church. A church. Instead of a movement. A church. Okay, so right here, it went from a movement to a church. Okay, so 1863 marks the end of the movement. And Jesus is going to finish the work the same way he began it. How's he going to finish it? In a movement, in a movement not in a church. Right. Okay, so, so, so when he is going to bring us back to the movement, he has to do a cleansing of the temple. And where is it that he takes the movement to that particular point? Where now? When is it you said? Where, where, or when? However you want to say it. September seventh. 
September 7th. Yeah. Right here. Yeah. What, has he, what has he done? He's taken 9,700 out of the movement and all that is left is Gideon's 300. Okay, so right down here uh, in September 7th, he has now brought us to where? What's going on in this history? A movement. Okay, but what's going on? What is this chiastic structure teaching more than anything else? What's the primary lesson from this chiasm? opening up of Daniel? Like yes, the opening up of Daniel. The message. This is about a message being taught, right? When you get to Revelation 10, 11, when you get to January 11th, what do you have to do? Prophesy again. This is about the Lord opening up the midnight cry message, the loud cry message, whatever you say, however you want to define it. The midnight chiasm is speaking to the sanctuary being opened up. So he's brought us here. He's cleansed the temple. He's separated out the two classes of worshipers. Now he's opened up the message for them. Um, and where is the message identified that they're going to present? It's here. What's our, what's our message? It's to Adventism. The to the Levites. Okay, so he's, he's opening up the, the work of plowing uh, the, the Levites, thereafter the Nethanims. So in this history here, the reason, and this is the one point I want to make, the reason that this history here, or not the reason, but this history here, Begins where? Let me focus this in on this history again. What was March 27th, 2020? What took place? The, the proclamation of 100 days of prayer because of the pandemic, right? <laughs> so that's by the Adventist church. So this chiasm is about Adventism. Who's going to give the message to Adventism? We, we are. Okay, Future for America, the priests. So, what was this, what was this, Waymark? What was the message on the, a closed door here? What, the next day, what was the message? 1863. 1863. When he brings us to the message, he brings us to the understanding of this chiasm, and he takes us right here to 1863. What's 1863? It's right here. He's taking us back here to where the church of Adventism is put into history. And now the message that's going to go to the, the remnants of this church that has already been passed by, it begins right where it ended at 1863 with a shut door. And a warning of a coming shut door. Can't, can't we also align uh, Caesarea Philippi there, where he takes them and then he's Peter up on this rock, and then there's a new church. He begins, same thing, passes by, starts a movement. Is that right? Yes, yeah, Caesarea Philippi. I, I erase this line. Uh, these lines I down, down here is um, what? Well, it's Paneum. So it depends on which one of those lines you're looking at. But yes, that's, that's where he's going to... I'm not fully understanding the relationship between 1860 and March 27th. I don't... I'm saying that the movement that was raised up at the end of the world ends at 1863. Okay? But he's going to finish the work right where he started it with a movement. This is the movement. This is the old movement. In order to get this movement in a position where it can proclaim the final warning message, he has to cleanse the temple. If, you want to, if we use those terms, there's other terms. You could use Gideon, okay? He has, to, he has to take it down to 300, which he did. Takes it down to 300 here, 
at, at 9-7, and in this chiastic history, he's going to open up the message to us, okay? Now he's, he's separated out the wise and the wicked. He's saying, here's the message you have. And so now I'm saying, so what is the message? And the message we have is defined not by this chiastic structure alone, it's also defined by this chiastic structure identifying that the message goes to the Levites. Okay, so the three posts in this chiastic structure, March 27th, March 27th, March 27th, the center one defines the theme. The center one is Adventism, proclaiming this 100 days of prayer. So this has to be about Adventism. So over here, this ministry, in 2019, on March 27th, in this room, the 27th and the 28th, it's going to give two messages. On the 27th, it's a closed door. On the 28th, it's 1863. Thus identifying that the message now to Adventism, it's taking the message of Adventism right back to here where the door was closed on them, where they were no longer a movement, now they're a church. So as he's reinstituting the movement, the last generation, in his message to Adventism, he's taking them right back to where they lost their way here. Okay? And if, I have Go ahead, Manuel. Um, um, Wow, I'm just blown away. Um, but um, so, if March 27, 2019, you did a presentation on a closed door, then the next day is 1863, and then we tie that 1863, okay, to the March 27th date. And I'll, I'll just kind of be brief. The 263s from 97 to January 11th, those 263s are 126, which is in a sense that period of darkness before um, the birth of something else, I guess, as Gideon's army, the 300, purified. But I was always thinking, sorry if I'm twisting things, I was always thinking about this 2020 minus the cross, the 31 AD when Christ died, and that equals 1989. So even at the beginning there, in January 11th, 2020, um, if we take from the cross all the way to that date, there's 1989 years. You lost me. The, I, everybody uh, else is probably sorry, following you, but I'm not. <laughs> sorry. I, I, I'll, I'll say it later. I'll say it later. <laughs> well, I'm not, I wasn't telling you you have to shut up. I'm saying uh, you lost me. I, it, but was everyone else following that? No, it was too much. It has, should, should be shown on a board. Okay, well, what's yours? And mine isn't isn't as complicated. We'll um, see. And don't have to have it on a board. But what I'm seeing is on 1863, if you take it as a prophetic mirror and you go backwards, then what we are going to be is the the perfect fulfillment of the of the glory that God has intended for His people to be. If you understand what I'm saying, because no, no. it was a from 1840 to 1844 was a glorious manifestation of the power of God. And if you go backwards and you start with 1863 and you go backwards into the movement, then that's what we will be a glorious well, manifestation. Well, I, I, I kind of get God. what you're saying, and, but that is sort of what I'm saying is that in this history here, he's opened the message to us, and the message is to Adventism. This is the beginning of Adventism. And it began in 1863, so he's bringing it all back here. Yeah. And he's reinstituting a movement because he began with a movement, he's going to finish with a movement. And we will be, the, we, the, those that follow in uh, on will be the perfect fulfillment of that glorious manifestation that was from 1840 to 1840. Yeah, our whole, this whole history with the... the 1533, it's already been a glorious manifestation of the power of God for quite some time. Brown? There's something divine in that, that he was able to take this 1863 shut to our message and first purge out of our movement because he says he begins with the leaders of the house of Israel and then go into the Seventh-day Adventist as a whole because he first dealt with us here and then he moved on, and only this spe specific message could do that twofold work. 
Does that yeah, make sense? Yeah, yeah, that's that's exactly right. He had to cleanse the movement first before, it could go before he could use it as an instrument. Now he's he's going to reach out to the former covenant people, yes. the the Levites, and then he's going to reach out to the world. Otherwise, it would have been just confusion. Brother no, Daniel. It's a November, November 9th is uh, midnight, right? Yes. Okay. And it's the center of those two sixty threes right there. Yeah, but this is all midnight at another level. Yes, I understand. <laughs> okay. So there seems to be some kind of connection between the fact that you have those two sixty threes and March 27th, this year at least, is dependent or hinges on those 263s and it starts March 27th is we're brought back to 1863. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, and if you come back to 1863 here and you yeah, you see the the relationship is there but also I'm not going to go there. It's, I don't want to go uh, I got to get focused. But yes, I I understand your logic. I agree with that. There's a connection. There's no, the Lord isn't just getting lucky with numbers. This is the work of Palmoni. And we have to recognize this to have confidence that he has been leading us in order to have the confidence to give this, this message that's coming. Okay, so I want to make a point about Isaiah 23.1. It says, the burden, which means a prophecy of Tyre, howl ye ships of Tarshish, for it is laid waste, so that there is no house, no entering in from the land of Kittim, it is revealed to them. The, the point I want to make about verse 1 is, what reveals this whole chapter? What reveals this prophecy? And what is this prophecy? If you go down into this prophecy, this is where it says that the papacy is forgotten for 70 years. And what is it that opens this truth up? And this truth for this movement, uh, to see the connection between the 70 years and the 1260, the, the kind of prophetic light that that produces, when you bring these lines together and realizing that the time the papacy's forgotten is the history of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, uh, it's the history of the United States, um, it's the relationship of the United States and the Seventh-day Adventist Church in fulfillment of Genesis 15 and Abraham's prophecy, it's the history that was illustrated by Joseph going down into Egypt and Moses coming out of Egypt, all these things are, are opened up when you recognize that the 70 years of literal captivity in Babylon typified the 1260 years of spiritual captivity in spiritual Babylon. That's where it opened up with this movement a long time ago. And I'm saying that in verse 1 of this chapter, which is so important, that this prophecy... The burden of Tyre, burden means prophecy, the, the prophecy of Tyre is revealed from Kittim. What does that mean? Because this is what opened it up. It was revealed, for, if, if, it, if Kittim hadn't been there, it wouldn't have been revealed. That's what I want you to understand. Okay? Go ahead. This is economics. This is talking about... No. It's not economic. The, the ships of Tarshish is always talking about... Uh, yeah, okay, but uh, yes, that's definitely part of it. But let's go down through this to see... You have a, you have a definition there of kittim. What's kittim? Patriol, whatever that means, from an unused name denoting Cyprus. Cyprus is a, a, an island, right? Okay, Sister, not Sister White, Uriah Smith comments on Daniel 11, verse 30, which refers to Kittim from Daniel and Revelation. And this is, this is old, old information in terms of, we've, we've used this passage from Daniel and Revelation many times. It's here where Uriah Smith is identifying Kittim as Carthage. Okay, um, and... 
I'm going to read, uh, he quotes verse 30, it says, The prophetic narrative still has reference to the power which has been the subject of the prophecy from the 16th verse, namely Rome. He's talking about Daniel 11. He's saying from verse 16 onward, the subject of Daniel 11 is Rome. What were the ships of Kittim that came against this power, and when was this movement made? What country or power is meant by Kittim? Then he's going to quote a theologian or uh, an expert, Dr. A. Clark on Isaiah 23.1 has this note, From the land of Kittim it is revealed to them, the news of the destruction of Tyre by Nebuchadnezzar is said to be brought to them from Kittim. Okay, the message of the king of the north, the understanding of the king of the north, and that's what we're taking up now, is the, the kingdom of the beast in Daniel's last vision. That message is opened up from Carthage, is what Cyprus is, and that's how Uriah Smith is going to define it. So, the message of the papacy comes from Carthage, Cyprus, Kittim, same names. Last paragraph. Was ever a naval warfare with Carthage as a base of operations waged against the Roman Empire? We have but to think of the terrible onslaught of the Vandals upon Rome under the fierce Genseric to answer readily in the affirmative, sallying, sallying every spring from the port of Carthage at the head of his numerous and well-disciplined naval forces, he spread consternation through all the maritime provinces of the empire. So I'm saying that the prophecy of Isaiah 23 is opened up from Carthage and uh, in, in Daniel 11, as Uriah Smith is explaining Daniel 11, verse 30, he references Genseric. Who is Genseric that launched from Carthage? One of the trumpet powers. Which one? The Vandals. The Vandals. It's the second one. Where do we put the first trumpet power. Right here. Where do we put the Vandals in Genseric? 9-11. And over here, we put the third, Attila the Hun, the fourth, um, after. But how long in the last phrase of that quote, I'm saying we place Kittim, Carthage, the Vandals at 9-11, and we've done it for years. And how long does Genseric rule from... 40 years. Oh, 40 years. Do we ever have a 40-year period from 9-11 to either midnight or the midnight cry? Either one? Yes. So what I'm saying is, if you're going to understand Isaiah 23, what do you have to understand? Four years. No, I, I, I led you down that road, but I passed you by. Kittim. Pardon me? Kittim. Kittim. Where do you mark Kittim prophetically? Kittim, which is Cyprus, which is Carthage. If you're going to put it on this line, where do you put it? 9-11. What is it that opens up this prophecy? It's 9-11. Verse 1 is saying from 9-11 it is revealed. It gets revealed from 9-11. It's putting an emphasis upon this way mark. That's why everyone that has left this movement in a big way publicly fights against 9-11. Because this, this is where the light comes. Does not the angel come down here and the earth is lightened with his glory? This is how, where Isaiah 23 is opened up from 9-11. Because 9-11 is Carthage, is Cyprus, is Kittim. And from Kittim it is revealed unto them. Okay, so now, pardon me? Pardon me? From the land of Kittim. From the land of Kittim. Okay, so 
I only have 15 minutes. I, I'm going to refer, I'm going to walk through these with you, these quotes on the bottom, yes? Because I'm just thinking, when you're speaking about Carthage, um, Uriah Smith actually speaks about, um, I think it's the Church of Smyrna. Sorry. So this is Revelation chapter 3 and verse... Yeah, I was saying this now. Sorry, it's, um, uh, okay, I was there just now, when they actually tried for 10 days, I was just, I was literally there just now. Yeah, that's chapter okay, 2, anyway, that's chapter 2. Yeah, chapter 2, verse, um, uh, it, it's, it's chapter 2, verse 10. Why am I not? Chapter 2, verse 10. Verse 10, yes. So, um, it's speaking about the 10 days of their trial. So it says, Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you in prison that ye may be tried, and shall have tribulation 10 days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of blood. And um, I was reading when I was, um, when I was reading about the seven and it speaks about the bishop uh, so I was just thinking of the 10 days and I was wondering if can, if the 10 days actually line up with um, with the like the 10 day like 10 being a Yes. Sort of okay, the, 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 way, the way that we've taught that through the years um, is that 1888 typifies 9-11. 1888 typifies 9-11. That there is a persecution that takes place in 1888 against Ellen White and against Jones and Wagner. And that 1888 lines up with Smyrna. Okay, and their persecution was for 10 days. So we bring all that into 9-11 and we put a number 10 next to it and say that there will be a persecution that takes place, a testing process, not a persecution necessarily, a testing process that begins at 9-11 um, unto the next church, which is Pergamos. So that's where we've applied it publicly for quite some time. So, yeah, but we're dealing with the trumpets right now, and i got to move forward. Um, but yes, that's how we understand it. So on the bottom of page one of your notes, Second Chronicles 9.21 talks about the ships of Tarshish bringing gold. Okay, they're a symbol of economic wealth. You have the reference. I'm not going to look at it. Then in Psalms... 48, we do need to look at that because we're going to line Psalm 48 up with 9-11. Psalm 48, verse 1. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God and the mountain of His holiness. Beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great King. God is known in her palaces for a refuge. For lo, the kings were assembled, they passed by together, they saw it, and so they marveled, they were troubled, and hasted away. Fear took hold upon them, and pain, as a woman in travail, thou breakest the ships of Tarshish with an east wind. The economic crisis that was brought at 9-11, we plug in there, these kings, or the ten kings, the globalists of planet Earth that had their economy um, stolen from them at 9-11. Um, and then if you go to Psalm 83, 
you'll find these ten kings listed out as ten kings, but you'll see their motivations uh, in verse 2 of Psalm 83, for lo, thine enemies, and then as you get down to verses 6 through 9, it's going to give you 10 enemies. This is the 10 kings. Verse 2 says, pardon me? I think it's 6 through 8. No, it's 6 through 8. What did I say? 10, 9, 6 through 9, it doesn't matter. For lo, thine enemies make a tumult, and they that hate thee have lifted up the head. It, 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 if you look at your notes on the next page, on page 2, a quote from Sister White says, Testimonies, Volume 7, page 182, The world is filled with storm and war and variance, yet under one head, the papal power, the people will unite to oppose God in the person of his witnesses. So in verse 2 of Psalm 83, God's enemies make a tumult, and they that hate thee have lifted up the head, that's the papacy, they've taken crafty counsel against thy people and consulted against thy hidden ones. When was his hidden ones hidden? 9-11. From 9-11 to 9-7. Yeah. 9-7, they've come out of hiding. Okay, but there's been crafty counsel taking against them mm -hmm. in that period of time. Uh, they've said, come and let us cut them off from being a nation, that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance, for they've consulted together with one consent. They are confederate. This is the evil confederacy uh, that Daniel was referring to on Sabbath. But go back to verse 1. Verse 1 says, Keep not thou silence, O God. Hold not thy peace. Be not still, O God. In this context, this hatred of the ten kings against God's people, the psalmist is saying, Make some noise, Lord. <laughs> okay, so when does the Lord make some noise? Psalm 119, 126. 119, 126 says what? 119, 126 says, It is time for thee, Lord, to work, for they have made void thy law. It is time for thee to work, Lord, they've made void their, thy law. When was in this, this movement the law made void? On August 29th, 2019, the health message was thrown out saying the sisters need to put on pants. Now there's a testing process from August 29th to November to uh, September 7th, 10 days. And in that testing process, the Lord begins to work. Okay, he's beginning to work because they've made void his law. And what's he doing? He's taken us to September 7th for what purpose? He's taken us to midnight because now he's going to open up the message. He's taken his people down to 300. Now he's going to open up the message through chronology, through prophetic application, so they knew who the, know who the target audience is. But more importantly, in my mind, is so they know who they are. You have to know who you are. You have to believe that you are this movement. But, okay, this comes... Does that mean that they don't know who they are? No, that means they probably won't know who they are because they're under strong delusion. But the, the, the old alpha movement has to understand... And how do they understand it? My argument has been, using his quote from Sister White, where she says, and I've used it several times, speaking of the history of the Millerites, she says, we had a message that was testified to by the miracle, miraculous workings of the power of God. It, it, that's a paraphrase. And I'm saying this step by step through the history of this movement is the miraculous working of the power of God, this chronology. And that's what testified to the message. And we have to see ourselves as the messengers in order to give this message. You wanted to say something? Okay. Page 2. 
They're going to, yes. Sorry, um, have you ever, I mean, I, I read this yesterday to a group of people up here where I was doing a lot of these studies with. It says, uh, just real quick, it says, it is not his will that they shall get into controversy over questions which will not help them spiritually, such as who is to compose the 144,000. This, those who are the elect of God will in a short time know without question. Have you ever heard that before? Yes. We teach that. He said this in his church. Oh, you teach it. Okay, praise yep. the Lord. Yep. It's a, that's the reason you're not supposed to argue about it. If you're among them, you will know. Oh, amen. 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 Okay, under one head, the, the, the enemies that are seeking to destroy God's people, they're going to lift up one head. And I have in here uh, a commentary on Pope Pius IV. We've reviewed, reviewed this a couple times. Uh, the 6th, and he was born on December 25th. So this is showing a connection with him and the King of the South, because the December 25th is a, a symbol of the King of the South, okay? And his, he was born on a year that's a doubling, 1717. Um, and he died in captivity in August 29th, 1799. In this particular Wikipedia quote, it doesn't say the 29th. But it was the 29th, 220 years later, takes you to the rebirth, the, the, the resurrection of this uh, idea in this movement. Um, but when is the papacy at the end of the world going to be born as the eighth kingdom of Bible prophecy? On December 25th at the Threefold Union. So this guy's birth is typifying the birth of modern Rome at the Sunday Law, and his death was typifying the birth of Rome in this movement, when they begin to exercise papal authority in Germany. But I'm saying this movement in a poor way, in that the new movement, okay? August 29th. August 29th. So, um... Tarshish, this is verse 12, 25, and 26 of Ezekiel, identifying who Tarshish is, um, because the east wind is going to sink the ships of Tarshish, and we're saying that hit on 9-11. Tarshish was thy merchant, the ships of Tarshish, and it names about 15, 16 merchants in this passage in Ezekiel. But it begins with identifying Tarshish, and it ends with Tarshish. Beginning and ending, the symbol of these merchant ships is Tarshish. Um, and it says, The ships of Tarshish did sing of thee in thy market, and thou was replenished, and made very glorious in the midst of the seas. Thy rowers have brought thee into great waters. The east wind has broken thee in the midst of the seas. This is the second reference we've referred to, Psalms 81. Uh, the kings are troubled because the east wind sinks the, the ships of Tarshish, the economic structure. And where is this truth revealed from? 9-11, which is Carthage. We begin to understand these things. Pardon me? Psalms 81. No, it's 9-11. And it's Psalms 83, and yes, go there. Does, does Psalms 83 represent 9-11? Brother Jeff? Yes. On one of the, the prior passages that you had, had used, Psalm 119, 126. Right. Had you noted that the chapter 119, both in the European and the American nomenclature, gives you 911, mm -hmm. yeah. and then the verse 126 is a fractal of the 2520? Yeah. No. I may have heard that before and it slipped my mind, but that's a pretty cool observation. Yeah, it is. Okay, in, uh, thank you for pointing that out. Um, you got your finger in Psalm 83, Kathy? Yep. Okay, keep your finger there and go back to where we started the Psalm 48. That's something I want to show you in Psalm 48. 
verse 6. It, it, verse 4, it's the kings. Okay, this is the globalists. Verse 6 says, Fear took hold upon them, and pain as a woman in travail. Thou breakest the ships of Tarshish with an east wind. Ever had a baby? Yep. How's a woman's travail? Hurts. It hurts, but... Harder and harder. It, it comes in a cycle. Harder and harder, closer and closer. Okay, so these kings, the east wind hits at 9-11, and it's only going to escalate. The labor pains are going to get harder and harder until the birth. When's the birth? December 25th is the birth. Right. That's when Pope Pius IV or whatever it was is born, December 25th. That's when the threefold union is put in place. That's where the papacy's deadly wound is healed. Okay, so, but now to Psalm 83. Psalm 83, um, verse 2, they lift up the papacy. They've taken crafty counsel against the hidden ones in verse 3. Verse 4, they said, Come, let us take, cut them off from being a nation. For they've consulted, verse 5, together with one consent, their confederate. They're wanting to do that at 9-11, before 9-11. The, the Patriot Act is going to get implemented at 9-11. When was the Patriot Act written? Previous. 19. 1996. Okay, so the east wind turns them away from this activity. And this, this passage in Psalm 83 is just telling us what their, the motivation of their heart is. And then it lists out those ten kings. The globalists are already in place before 9-11. When do the globalists, globalists come into place? 45. Right? 45 on December. No, 45. What happened in 45? Oh, the, the, UN. the United Nations starts. 1945. Oh. Okay. Okay. Back to our notes. Revelation 18, and we won't read all these. Re Revelation 18, verses 8 through 19, is speaking about these merchants that are wailing and mourning that Babylon is taken down. Verse... 11, and the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her. Okay, um, in Ezekiel 27, they do the very same thing. And if you read down through 18, verse 18, they're going to ask these merchants, these kings, and cried when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What city is like unto this great city? Go back to Ezekiel. 27.12, Ezekiel 27.12, these merchants that are represented by the ships of Tarshish, in verse 12, in verse, it's not verse 12, Ezekiel 27.12, they're going to ask the same question. Talking about Tarshish and 12? It's maybe talking about Tarshish, but what I read in you want to the east wind? no, where it, where in verse eighteen of of Revelation eighteen, Revelation eighteen eighteen, these merchants and it cried when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, "What city is like unto this great city?" And these merchants in verse thirty two of Ezekiel twenty seven. It says, And in their willing they shall take up a lamentation for thee and lament over thee, saying, What city is like Tyrus, like the destroyed in the midst of the sea? Okay, there. And who's Tyrus? 2732. 2732. Isaiah. Of Ezekiel. Ezekiel. Yeah, what's the first one? They, it, in Isaiah 23. Isaiah 23. Verse it doesn't say that in Isaiah 23, but what it says in Isaiah 23 is it identifies who Tyre is. So if you go back to Isaiah 23, remember verse 1 is the prophecy of Tyre. And in verse 15, well, verse 14, it says, How ye ships of Tarshish, for your strength is laid waste. Why is the ships of Tarshish strength laid waste according to Psalm 48 and according to Ezekiel 27? 
because of the east wind. Okay, verse 15. And it shall come to pass in that day that Tyre shall be forgotten seventy years according to the days of one king. And at the end of seventy years shall Tyre sing as a harlot. Who sings as a harlot? The papacy. Take a harp and go about the city, thou harlot that has been forgotten. Make sweet melody, sing many songs that thou mayest be remembered. When is she remembered? When is the remembering marked in prophecy? At the Sunday law. The Sunday law. Remember the Sabbath day. Zechariah means remembered. She gets remembered then. And it, it shall come to pass at the end of 70 years that the Lord will visit Tyre and shall turn her to her higher and shall commit fornication with all the kingdoms upon the face of the earth. And in verse... Where... Uh, okay, all right. So, now we're at the point to where we can start establishing the vision. Are you following the thought? Isaiah 23 is about the papacy who's forgotten for the history of the United States for 70 years, for 1260 prophetic years. At the end of that time, she's going to be remembered, which is a prophetic characteristic. She's forgotting, forgotten at the beginning of the history of the United States. What king of Judah marks the beginning of the history of the United States? Manasseh. Manasseh. What does Manasseh mean? To forget. to forget. Okay, so in 1798, Manasseh is marking the forgetting of the papacy. She's hid until she's going to give birth on December 25th, 2021 at the Sunday Law. Then she's going to be remembered. Remember the Sabbath day. Who speaks at that point? Zechariah speaks. He's been struck dumb since when? Since 9-11. Why was he struck dumb? Unbelief. Unbelief of what? Of time. There's no way his wife was going to give birth because she was past the time of giving birth. She was too old. So he rejects the element of time at 9-11. But he remembers. Who else remembers at, what else is remembered at the Sunday Law? Daniel threw it in the mix the other day. It's Revelation 18. Her sins are going to be remembered, and he's going to double unto her double. Okay, so remembering is the Sunday law. How, how can you know these things? How was it revealed to you? Kittim. The ships of Kittim. Islam. 9-11 is where it's revealed. Okay, and Rome establishes the vision. Let me go through... Pardon me? The first 30 years of the FFA chiasm, you could remember these things if you just went back through 96, 2004, 2012. All these things are just what we've already learned. Okay, I'm going to go, I'm going to start going into the kingdom of the beast. Um, but I want to, I want to, I'll come back, I'll reorganize these notes for tomorrow. I'm already over time, but I want to get to a certain point here. On page 3, and I won't deal with it right now, but in verses 21 and 22, this current pope is the vile person. He's the last pope. He's going to come to his end with none to help. You can see there that he's the first Jesuit pope, the first from America. Yeah, Pope Francis. He's the 266th Pope. Um, and he's the first from the Southern he Hemisphere. The first from the Americas. Of the Americas. He is a Jesuit. Okay, so I'm wanting to put in place the significance of him being a Jesuit. This is Sister White commenting on the, commenting on the Jesuits, and she's going to mention two things in here that need to be marked, I believe. <laughs> The role of the Jesuits and the Inquisition. Okay. Throughout Christendom, Protestantism was menaced by formidable foes. This is a great controversy. The first triumphs of the Reformation passed. Rome summoned new forces, hoping to accomplish its destruction. 
At this time, the order of the Jesuits was created. Remember, the people that, cir that circle Sister White's house and take it away from her, they do it because she speaks against their holy order. Mm -hmm. At this time, the order of the Jesuits was created the most cruel, unscrupulous, and powerful of all the champions of popery. Cut off from earthly ties and human interests, dead to the claims of natural affection. Do you believe that Sister White is inspired? Amen. The reason that I'm saying that is I have in here the Jesuit oath. And there's always a controversy about whether the Jesuit oath is real or not. But the reason there's a controversy about whether the genuine Jesuit oath is real or not is because that oath makes certain claims. Okay, and if you read the oath and you read what Sister White's saying, she's upholding every one of the really hard claims that they want to deny are actually there. She upholds them. Okay, dead to the claims of natural affection. That comes right from the Jesuit oath. Reason and conscience, holy silence. They knew no rule, no tie, but that of their order and no duty but to extend its power. The gospel of Christ had enabled its inherents to meet danger and endure suffering, undismayed by cold, hunger, toil, and poverty, to uphold the banner of truth in, face, in, the face, in face of the rack, the dungeon, and the stake. To combat these forces, Jesuitism inspired its followers with a fanaticism that enabled them to endure like dangers and to oppose the power of truth all the weapons of deception. There was no crime too great for them to commit, no deception too base for them to practice, no disguise too difficult for them to assume. Vowed to perpetual poverty and humility, it was their studied aim to secure wealth and power and to be devoted to, over, to the overthrow of Protestantism and to the reestablishment of papal supremacy. When appearing as members of their order, they wore the garb of sanctity, visiting prisons and hospitals, ministering to the sick and to the poor, professing to have renounced the world, and bearing the sacred name of Jesus, who went about doing good. But under this blameless exterior, the most criminal and deadly purposes were often concealed. It was a fundamental principle of this order that the end justifies the means. By this code, lying, Theft, perjury, assassination were not only pardonable, but commendable. Assassination was commendable. They actually have a biblical verse where they pretty much demand that Jesuits do murder someone. Okay? Um, when they served the interest of the church. They were spies. Um, it, the rest of that paragraph marks them as spies. The last sentence says, The Jesuits rapidly spread themselves over Europe, and wherever they went, they follow, there followed a revival of popery. Now here's the second part, the Inquisition. To give them greater power, a bull was issued re-establishing the Inquisition. Next paragraph. So were the means which Rome... So were the means which Rome had invoked to quench the light of the Reformation, to withdraw men from the Bible, and to restore the ignorance and superstition of the Dark Ages. Jesuitism and the Inquisition. That's what she marks. These were the means. Now the next quote from Sister White, that was Great Controversy 234. The next quote comes from Testimonies, Volume 9, beginning on page 11. Satan is a diligent... This isn't page 11, but this is where this passage begins. Satan is a dil diligent Bible student. He knows that his time is short, and he seeks at every point to counterwork the work of the Lord upon this earth. It is impossible to give any idea of the experience of the people of God who shall be alive upon the earth when celestial glory and a repetition of the persecutions of the past are blended. They will walk in the light proceeding from the throne of God. By means of angels, there will be a constant communication between heaven and earth. And Satan, surrounded by evil angels and claiming to be God, will work miracles of all kinds to deceive, if possible, the very elect. 
God's people will not find their safety in working miracles, for Satan will counterfeit the miracles that will be wrought. God's tried and tested people will find their power in the signs spoken of in Exodus 31, 12 through 18. They are to take their stand upon the living word. It is written. This is the only foundation upon which they can stand securely. Those who, have been, those who have broken their covenant with God will in that day be without God and without hope. The worshipers of God will be especially distinguished by their regard for the fourth commandment since this is the sign of God's creative power and the witness to his claim upon man's reverence and homage. The wicked will be distinguished by their efforts to tear down the Creator's memorial and exalt the institution of Rome. Parmender. Next paragraph. Fearful tests and trials await the people of God. The spirit of war is stirring the nations from one end of the earth to the other. But in the midst of the time of trouble that is coming, a time of trouble such has not been since there was a nation. God's chosen people will stand unmoved. Satan and his hosts cannot destroy them, for angels that in excel in strength will protect them. Now I have here the Jesuit oath. In the first part of it, they reaffirm that you have taken the, the, the oath of Catholicism. So it's, it's the first part is the oath of Catholicism. If you go to page 6 of your notes, now they're walking you through how the, there's three persons involved. If I'm going to be a Jesuit, there's going to be three persons that are take me through this ritual. And the superior is the guy that's going to ask me questions. And I'm going to respond. And I'm going to state this quote, uh, uh, this, this oath. Um, and I, everyone should read this. I'm not, I did, never intended to read this all the way through, even if I would have had the time. But on, the, on page 6, this last paragraph of affirming that a guy that's getting taken into the Jesuit order has already made an oath of Catholicism. Notice this last paragraph before the subtitle says the extreme oath of the Jesuits. It says, You have received all your instructions heretofore as a novice, a neophyte, and have served as a co-adjutor, confessor, and priest, but you have not yet been invested with all the necessary, that all that is necessary to command the army of Loyola in the service of the Pope. You must serve the proper time as an instrument and executioner as directed by your superiors. For none can command here who has not consecrated his labors with the blood of the heretic, for without the shedding of blood, no man can be saved. Therefore, to fit yourself for your work and make your own salvation sure, you will, in addition to your former oath of obedience to your order and allegiance to the Pope, repeat after me. Now, this is the Jesuit oath. Everyone needs to read it, but I, I'm just going to take some snippets out of it. Page 7, top paragraph. I do further promise and declare that notwithstanding I'm dispensed with to assume my religion heretical for the propaganda of Mother Church interests to keep secret and private all her agents' counsels. One of their primary characteristics is secrecy. And anyone that claims, such as Tess does, that the Jesuits have been open is, is a Jesuit. Even if they're not a, a Jesuit, they're, they're, they're speaking the Jesuit uh, technique of changing history. One of the things that the Jesuits are known for is changing history. Okay. Um, the fourth paragraph on page 7, this oath, says, I furthermore promise and declare that I will, when opportunity present, make and wage relentless war, secretly or openly, against all heretics, Protestants and liberals. What's a liberal in this context? Communists. The, the, the revolutionaries of France, okay? And I am directed to do, to 
extirpate and exterminate them from the face of the whole earth, and that I will spare neither age, sex, or condition, and that I will hang, waste, boil, flay, strangle, and bury alive these infamous heretics, rip up the stomachs and wombs of their women, and crush their infants' heads against the wall in order to annihilate forever their execrable race." that when the same cannot be done openly, I will secretly use the poison cup, the strangling cord, the steel of the poignard, or the leaden bullet, regardless of honor, rank, dignity, or authority of the person or persons, whatever may be their condition in life, either public or private, as I at any time may be directed so to do by any agent of the Pope or superior of the Brotherhood of the Holy Faith of the Society of Jesus. I, I hate even reading that. It's, it's, it's uh, yeah, it's I, so you weren't reading it. I was. So, I know, but so it's we go down through here, and it finishes off. Okay. So what I want to remind us of: you need to read this. You need to know what you're dealing with. Okay, is, is what I'm saying. I don't need to promote it through the roof. But on the bottom of page ten, eight. Bottom of page eight. You have the statement of the Seventh-day Adventist Church declaring the 100 days of prayer. This is something for us. This is part of this chiastic, Levitical chiasm. Okay. On the next page, on the very same day, the very same day, it says, Pope Francis delivered an Urip et Orbi prayer from the empty St. Peter's Square at the Vatican, Friday, March 27, 2020, praying in a desolate, empty St. Peter's Square, Pope Francis on Friday likened the coronavirus pandemic to a storm laying bare illusions that people can be self-sufficient and instead finds all of us fragile and disoriented and needing each other's help and comfort. So both the Adventist Church and the Catholic Church mark March 27th as a day of prayer due to the pandemic. Okay, so now I want to walk you through something, and this, is, this will be much briefer than you, you might think. October 13th, 1917, the Fatima miracle takes place, and the October Revolution of the King of the South, the Bolshevik Revolution, takes place in Russia. In 1946, and I'm dealing with four generations, I'm saying that the Adventist Church has passed by in 1989, and that in 1957, their fourth generation is a generation of darkness. But the fourth generation, you become Catholic, where you're prepared to bow down to the sun at the Sunday Law. And the Adventist Church is speaking to that new movement. They, they're tested by these four generations of Adventism. But what I'm saying is, in this fourth generation of Adventism, third and fourth, he's going to bring judgment on third and fourth generation, they're turned into Catholics. Okay, so in 1946, in the Ministry Magazine, an Adventist publication for the, primarily for the theologians and the pastors, they put this in the record. When the finished products, they're talking about church publications, when the finished product carries the stamp of the standard publishing house, it bears denominational approval. It is then a denominational and not a private publication. It is a measure of authority. Okay, what it means, they're saying, if this is an official Adventist publication, what's written in here is our official position. Does Rome do that? Yes. Yes, they have what they call an imprimata. When they publish something, they put this stamp on it. There was only one Seventh-day Adventist theologian that ever wrote a book that actually got, did his research in the Vatican Library, and when he was done, his name was Bakioki, and it was about from Sabbath to Sunday, they put their imprimata on it saying, we approve this book. And that was an Adventist book. So the Catholic Church, when it puts its seal of approval upon a publication, it says this is our official position. And the Adventist Church in 1946 in Ministry Magazine said that we do the same thing. If you read it in one of our publications, then it's the gospel. Okay. Uh, 1952... Dr. Jean Nussbaum, Religious Liberty Secretary of the Southern European Division, has six different audiences with Pope Pius VII. Um, 
it is one, this is Great Controversy 51, it is one of the leading doctrines of Romanism that the Pope is the visible head of the Universal Church of Christ. They're going to lift up one head, invested with supreme authority over bishops and pastors in all parts of the world. More than this, the Pope has been given the very titles of deity. He has been styled Lord God the Pope and has been declared infallible. And we went and started interacting with him in 1952. 1956, Eternity Magazine. What's Eternity Magazine? At that time, it was like the Cadillac of the evangelical world's magazines. And if you read this, they're going to tell you how they were interacting with Seventh-day Adventists and that the Seventh-day Adventist Church threw out all the doctrines that they'd formerly believed because they had been laboring with them in 1956 leading up to a book that's going to be published called Questions on Doctrine. Notice what Ministry Magazine says. It was perceived that Adventists were strenuously denying certain doctrinal positions which they had previously attributed to them. The position of Adventism seems to be a new position. Adventism in 1956 is a far cry from Adventism of the past. The position of Adventism has either been revised or reversed. SDA leaders repudiated the Seventh-day Sabbath keeping as a basis of salvation or in any way a means of salvation. The doctrine that we must overcome sin by uniting with divinity and perfectly keeping God's law in order to be saved was changed to salvation, which they, Seventh-day Adventists and Evangelicals, confess to be Christ alone. Salvation is by grace alone through the blood of Christ apart from any works of the law. The doctrine of Christ's work was not accomplished at, on Calvary, but since 1844 he's been carrying on a second ministry was totally repudiated. The teaching that Christ took man's fallen sinful nature upon him and overcome sin with that nature was disavowed again and again by responsible leaders of the Seventh-day Adventist Church and was repudiated with horror. Fall, 1956, Eternity Magazine. Now in 1957, it's not just going to be the evangelicals that say they did it. They're going to publish the book Questions on Doctrine, which makes all these claims. Okay, this is where the darkness comes that precedes the time of the end in 1989. Sister White says, God will arouse other means, yes. his people, if other means fail, heresies will come in among them, which will sift them, separating the chaff from the wheat. Walking through this history, 1962, Vatican II, you need to understand Vatican II. The Second Ecumenical Council of the Vatican, commonly known as the Second Vatican Council or Vatican II, and addressed relations between the Catholic Church and the modern world. This was their battle plan for gathering back all the Protestant churches into their fold. Vatican II was for that purpose. Okay. In Vatican II... They speak about celebration, celebration, celebration. What is celebration in the Catholic Church? Any form of worship that they do, they call a celebration. When they do the Mass, it's the celebration of the Mass. When they do the baby sprinkling, it's the, the celebration of the baptism. Every act, worship activity that the Catholic Church does is called celebration. Okay, what is the highest form of celebration worship in the Catholic Church? The auto de fe was a major aspect of tribun tribunals and the final step in the Inquisition process. The height of celebration worship in the Catholic Church is the death of heretics. Yeah. Okay, so Vatican II is designing how to bring the Protestant churches back to Rome, and the documents that come out of Vatican II, it's all about celebration, celebration, celebration. Whereas, dropping down to where it says Vatican I, Vatican I, the Vatican Council was convo convoked by Pope Pius IX on June 29, 1868, after a period of planning and preparation, that began on 6 December 1864. This, the 20th Ecumenical, 
Ecumenical Council of the Catholic Church held three centuries after the Council of Trent opened on the 8th of December, 1869. Please notice the First Vatican opened on December 8th and ended on a year later on 20 of October. And up at the top of the page, um, or, no, it's on the bottom of the page, the Second Vatican Council is going to end on December 8th. So what's December 8th? See, the one opened on December 8th in Vatican I, and Vatican II ended on December 8th. They're both a couple years long. What, what, what's December 8th? On bottom, bottom page 10, on December 8th, 1854, Pope Pius IX issued his apostolic constitution, Ineffabilis Deus, in which he established Catholic doctrine that the Virgin Mary, mother of Jesus, had been conceived without the original sin that every other human being is born with. So both of these Vatican meetings, Vatican I and Vatican II, are celebrating that Mary was free from sin. Okay, Out of the first one comes the doctrine of infallibility, and out of the second one in the early 1960s comes the battle plan for taking back the Protestant world. you got to see this. We're almost done. 1965, B.B. Beach, Secretary, Northern European, Western African Division, becomes active member of the World Council of Churches, and the Pope visits the United States for the first time. 1966, the Catholic Charismatic Movement begins. Out of Vatican II, they determine the way they reach the the Protestants is through the Charismatic Movement and through celebration worship. So what do they have to do? They have to start a charismatic movement in the Catholic Church. Four years after Vatican II, they start it. It begins. 1968, can two walk together unless they be agreed? After Elder Pierre Lanaric, Elder Roland Hegstead, Elder Leif Tobiasen of Andrews University meet with Pope Pius VI, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and a Vatican secretary join an arm of the World Council of Churches called the World Confessional Families, now called the Christian World Communion. The Seventh-day Adventists join the Faith and Order Commission of the World Council of Churches as personal observers, which means, di by definition, full voting members. 1968, they are full mo voting members of the World Council of Churches. 1973, pardon me? Elder? Yes. Excuse me. There's no way they met with Pope Pius VI. Pope Pius VI had died in, uh, I believe, 1799. Uh all right, well, then I got, a, I got a typo there. Thank you. There's a typo under 1968. Let's just say he met with the Pope, okay? And whoever is the Pope in 1968 is who he met with. Okay, um, 1973, B.B. Beach and Dr. Lucas Vischer, as members of the Faith and Order Commission, co-author So Much in Common. Now, what's this mean? Well, it's an Adventist publication. This is the position of the church. And in pages 100, 101, since 1968, the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists has been actively represented at the annual meeting of the Secretaries of World Confessional Families. They're not denying they've been connected with the papacy and the World Council of Churches since the 60s. Now, in 1974, this is a little bit out of step, but it's about Desmond Ford. Desmond's Ford New Theology Ravages Adventism. And a lot of people leave Adventism because of Desmond Ford, the rejection of the sanctuary, the rejection of Ellen White. Point being is they're in darkness since 1957. Desmond Ford is simply taking the new doctrines that they've put in place in questions on doctrine and applying them as he should, and they're reaping what they sowed. 1975. Speaking for the General Conference, President Neil Wilson states under oath, this is where 
we've already put this in the record. Although it is true that there was a period in the life of the Seventh-day Adventist Church where the term hierarchy was used in a pejorative sense to refer to the papal form of church government, that attitude on the church's part was nothing more than a widespread anti-popery among conservative Protestant denominations in the early part of this century and the latter part of the last, and which has now been consigned to the historical trash heap so far as the Seventh-day Adventist Church is concerned. 1977, B.B. Beach presents a medal from the Seventh-day Adventist Church to Pope John Paul II. The, the medal illustrates the second coming of Christ with Christ standing on the earth. Now some people say, no, that's really not illustrating the second coming of Christ on this coin. It's illustrating the resurrection. Okay, but in either case, the other side of the coin is emphasizing the Sabbath. It, it has the Ten Commandments there, and what is, the, what is the, the, of the Ten Commandments, which one is spelled out? The Fourth Commandment, and it says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Who spells out the Fourth Commandment that way? No, the, the, oh, Rome. Yeah. Rome, okay? So if you're going to claim that the, the other side of the coin, that this is the resurrection, when does Rome say the resurrection took place? On the day of the sun. And we give this gold coin to the papacy in 1977. In Signs of the Times, February 19th, 1984, it is a backslidden church that lessens the distance between itself and the papacy. 1981, the Pope and Reagan are both suffering an assassination attempt. That assassination attempt turns on the lights for Pope John Paul II to believe that he is the good Pope of the Fatima prophecy. Okay, so there's, there, that's a significant event in Fatima, and we're dealing with the kingdom of the beast. We're putting this in the records for when we return to it. 1982, Seventh-day Adventist faith and order represented, signed the bap... <laughs> now the Adventist church is going to sign the baptism, Eucharist, and ministry document from the World Council of Churches. What does that mean? Well, Sister White speaks to it. Great Controversy 59, the scriptural ordinance of the Lord's Supper has been supplanted by the idolatrous sacrifice of the Mass. Papal priests pretended by their senseless mummery to convert the simple bread and wine into the actual body and blood of Christ. With blasphemous presumption, they openly claimed the power of creating God, the creator of all things. And here's the part I want you to see. Christians were required on pain of death to avow their faith in this horror horrible, heaven-insulting heresy. Multitudes who refused were given to the flames, and in 1982, the Seventh-day Adventist Church signed a document that agreed to that doctrine. Yeah. 1983, a book is published called Unity of the Churches. This isn't written by Jesuits Heinrich Fries and Carl, Carl Reiner as the blueprint for unification. It was taken from the Baptism, Eucharist, and Ministry document, which in turn was taken from Vatican II. Among the many plans in this book, it is stated every church needs a creed. The book Seventh-day Adventists Believe, published five years later in 1988. 1985, Almost done here. I got to get this one in the record book from 1985. Vincent Simon of the Society of Pentecostal Studies has a meeting where he openly lays out the blueprint for merging Rome and Protestant Pentecostal movements. Pope's, Pope summons an extra ordinary synod of bishops to celebrate the 20th anniversary of Vatican II. They're being successful. How to bring Protestantism back that same year. So that's where they started it in their church to show the success that it could be done and then... They captured the charismatic movement yeah. to use as their Trojan horse. Yeah. But notice this, this is the one I've been looking for and I, I found it. This is from the General Conference President Neil Wilson, Adventist Review in 1985. Division and General Conference officers form a criteria er, critical area of church leadership around the world. Vice Presidents, as you understand that Division Presidents are first Vice Presidents of the General Conference. Vice Presidents report to the General Conference President. According to the bylaws, while they serve a division, they are Vice Presidents of the General Conference. If you compare Vice Presidents to Cardinals, 
We already have a cardinal from Africa, and before this, the 1985 General Conference session ends, I predict we will have two African cardinals among our 15 vice presidents. There is no cardinal from all the countries of the Far East, while there will probably be two cardinals from Africa. So the president of the General Conference in 1985 is calling his vice presidents cardinals. So uh, Mark Finley is a, a cardinal. Mark Finley is a cardinal. Okay, 1985 celebration worship is introduced into the Seventh-day Adventist Church. This comes out of Vatican II and the Lord showed her that just before probation this kind of worship would come in. 1986, Chinese cell group brainwashing techniques adopted by Pentecostal movement. Though adopted from Chinese brainwashing techniques, it was first spiritually used, first used spiritually by the Blue Army. This hypnotic technique was first used by the Blue Army, a sect dedicated to the promotion of the miracles and teachings of Fatima. A book published outlining the plan from cell to celebration, used to have that book, was thereafter recommended for Adventist pastors as part of suggested reading in church growth concepts. 1987, General Conference uses Catholic attorney Vincent Ramick to prosecute John Merrick for using the Seventh-day Adventist name. 1989, please note this. 1989, time of the end, the spiritual exercises of Loyola Ignacio introduced into the Seventh-day Adventist Church. When you get to September 11, 2001, now you're going to have to be trained in those exercises if you want a paycheck. But when did it come in? 1989. Wow. 1990, invitation issued by General Conference of the Seventh-day Adventist Church for Vatican to send an observer, Reverend Thomas J. Mercy, Mur Murphy, Director of the Office of Ecumenism for Deci the Diocese of in 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 Indianapolis to the 55th session of the General Conference of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Bishop Thomas J. Murphy invited as official observer and to welcome delegates at the General Conference session and Indianapolis. And then you have the quote we read here recently from Testimonies, Volume 1. She knew these men well, and then she turned again to see them, and they turned into a Catholic procession. The fourth generation, they turn Catholic. Okay, so that's in the record because we're going to deal with Fatima, the inroads of Fatima, and the, the history of Daniel 11 verse 40. What's the history of Daniel 11 verse 40? 1798 to the Sunday Law. It's the same history that Tyre is forgotten for 70 years. It's the history of the United States, but the line that governs the story of the papacy and that history is Fatima. I think it's important that we call it what it is, which is a holy order, because that's in direct contrast to a movement. You know, what do you mean? I mean, she's calling it a holy order. So the two things that are going then simultaneously is a movement directed by the hand of God and, their and a holy, holy order. order. And their holy order. order. Maybe. She calls this the old movement and that the new movement. So she uses both she the movements. Um, That's right. I remember and that. Peter says, uh, we are a, a holy, peculiar people. Mm -hmm. We're not called order, so I wonder. All the God does all things in order. All right, I went way over time. Sorry, but I needed to get much of this in the record book as we take up the fourth kingdom. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, it is very difficult to be, be born into the history of the last generation of Adventism or even born thereafter and understand what has, how the Seventh-day Adventist Church has been transformed. It's even a greater task to understand that, that the testing that they failed from 1863 onward gets brought into our history from 9-11 onward. And it's difficult to understand how 
to navigate that prophetic history and come up on the right side of things. We're thankful that you are opening this up for us to see that we might be uh, prepared for the crisis that's ahead. We're thankful that you are awakening us to the, the fact that there is a genuine, serious battle that's on the horizon and that the enemies uh, that we're going to be confronted with are serious enemies and that the two, the two things that the papacy intends to use are these enemies of this uh, Jesuit order and the Inquisition. Um, to be forewarned is to be forearmed. We thank you for preparing us with this information um, that we can be among those that stand faithful in this coming crisis. We ask a blessing upon our day's work, um, whatever we may take up this day in Jesus' name. Amen.